No, I don't waste no time. going on guys so welcome to the video i am here with michael gardner who has a you just mentioned it was it b2b outreach agency basically right yeah yeah do you mind uh giving a brief introduction of what it is that you do yeah absolutely first off thanks for having me on the channel uh second off hi my name is michael i am a digital nomad and entrepreneur based out of Chiang Mai, thailand currently and I run an agency called Done For You Meetings. Essentially, we use cold email to book sales calls for B2B companies. So our clients are ag other agencies, consultants, coaches, software companies, and business service companies, something like accounting or legal. Really, anybody who sells something over $1,000 B2B, uh, we can get them sales calls. Yeah, that's cool, man. Like, like we said, because obviously we, we've spoken a couple of times now, and I've already mentioned, like, it's not something that you hear people do quite often. I think I I I think in in sort of our little part of the internet, you're the only person I know that actually does this successfully. Uh, how did you How did you go from because you started as an actual agency, right? And then you made the transition to this. Uh, how did that happen? Yeah, so starting in 2015, I had a social media management agency, and even back then, I was using cold email to get clients. Before I knew what cold email properly was, I would just send genuine yeah. emails and. Um, you know, I, that whole period of time I had, you know, a legion agency, social media management, e-commerce kind of hopping around, you know, more of like a glorified freelancer for VA rather than a proper agency. And yeah, um, yeah. I've been getting meetings very consistently from email. And I assumed everybody was getting meetings consistently from email. And a couple of years ago, I realized, well, that's not the case. I'm doing a lot better than other people. Started doing outreach for a couple of friends and did well for them. I started doing outreach to people i didn't know to get clients and uh fast forward to today we've worked with over 100 people and we actively manage around 50 clients um on campaign so it kind of went from you know what can i do that everybody's not doing because i i saw e-commerce yeah. specifically getting more and more competitive people are getting, like you look at like, the supply and demand curve right the, the supply of agencies that are doing it goes way up the demand goes down the people start not competing on price but competing on you know i'll double your uh, return on ad spend in 30 days or we give you like it just got like very cutthroat and I was like I, I wanted to get into a blue ocean and um, yeah. saw a big opportunity here yeah 100% man so over 50 clients you're currently working with with the with the outreach yeah so we have about 50 clients right now um, of those clients about 35 we actively manage their campaigns um, we've got about five or so, which we're doing um, consulting for, and the rest of them are a mixture of, you know, we have some people that uh, pay us for like initially to set their systems or they pay us for like ongoing uh, writing scripts. So yeah, about 35 where we fully manage your campaigns. Yeah, that's, that's crazy, man. How, how are you able to, to manage all of that? I like guess, is it automated for the most part, or are you still like actively in the trenches with all of this? Sure. So we make a huge use of automation systems, SOPs. Um, but uh, another thing is I have a business partner who we have really strictly split, split responsibilities. And this is one of the things that let us do really well. I am I'm not in fulfillment. Um, I am yeah. in creative, personal brand, sales, outreach, uh, but I am not in fulfillment. And he is not one second in social media or, or sales. He, he doesn't know what I do in terms of like the technicals, I don't know what he does in terms of the technicals. Uh, that way we can both do really good in our, on our thing per se. And then, you know, underneath him, we have about 16 uh, team members. Majority of them are like virtual assistants. Uh, however, we do have, you know, some salaried, um, we're not gonna say not legally employed, but salaried contractors who only work for us based in the UK and Canada, a couple other, a couple other spots. Yeah, that's crazy, man. I didn't know, actually know they had, 50 clients and 60 employees <laughs> you've, you've so you've built it up fairly quickly to be fair right because when did you make that transition i think on linkedin it says like a year and 10 months ago um something like about a bit under two years i think actually but i always go off like founded in 2015 so i never really changed agencies i just changed what we did because like it was yeah, always the same virtual assistants and the same website i just changed the name and the logo so um 
I yeah, I say since 2015, but this specific service, I've been under two years. Crazy, man. That's insane. So if you're managing 16 employees with 50 clients, like what does an average day look like for you? So I'm not really in operation. So I um for me, my the main things I do are going to be like the only thing I do with clients is I put out like the biggest fires. So if a fire goes yeah. beyond my COO, who's a minority partner, that's when it comes to me. So uh, really the only, I only do two things with clients. I put out really big fires, which is like an active dispute or, you know, a top tier client who's potentially going to drop so, something where it needs to come to me. And secondly, yeah. um, I help clients who are struggling with their offers. Cause that's something that I, I specialize in. So it's that less on fulfillment, more on like actually consulting them. Um, now, most of my time goes into our outreach team. So we have our own outreach team to get our own clients. Um, for our clients, we only do cold email, but to get our own clients, we do LinkedIn DMs, Instagram DMs, Facebook DMs, Twitter DMs, um, Upwork applications, cold email. We're getting clients through SEO, organic content, interviews like this. We have partnerships, a lot of cold email software companies where they send us referrals. So mainly outreach acquisition content when it really comes down to it my job is to get attention for the company and then to yeah. uh, turn that attention into clients yeah that's so cool man and um, yeah like you already mentioned there so one of the five you put out is people that are struggling with their offer uh, what is what is a common obviously you know we discussed this in our previous call as well but uh, what, what are like the common mistakes that you see when agencies try to do their email outreach themselves rather than like hand it over to experts like you guys yeah so I, I one thing I will say is if someone's just starting out, I actually do recommend they do their own outreach um, because it's a very expensive to hire someone like myself or someone else when you don't know your close rate and you don't yeah. actually know your retention. Uh, it's going to end up being, again, there's always outliers, but in general, you're better off doing it yourself. But in terms of why people struggle, um, specifically in e-commerce space based off the audience in your channel, uh, the really two main things I see. Thing number one is that a lot of people that are in this business space are very young, talking 17 to 24, yeah. 25. Maybe they haven't even had a job before. This is the first time they're entering the business world. Um, maybe you know they, this is their first business if they have had a job, just generally quite young. And mm -hmm. um, I think sometimes a bit ill-led just because of the mishmash of advice on the internet where people don't yeah. realize how, uh, like in there's, there's cool parts of the business, but also like, uh, like we were talking earlier, retention is such a big thing. So uh, that's that's one area I think people go wrong because they focus all on sales and they can't keep clients and then you can't really grow. And the second area is that a lot of people just do the same thing. You know, uh, let's take, I, I won't name drop, uh, but there's plenty of people who have great courses on how to start agencies, like really good courses. And it's a good idea to go through those courses. However, you have to factor that 10,000 other people have been through this course and 10,000 other people are all targeting the same people and not only the same people, but like we're using the same qualifiers that that guru teaches. So it's the same tiny little pocket of people that are getting the same email template, the same service. And exactly. also these beginners are copying the verbiage, even on their landing page, they try to talk like their mentor and it's yeah. not genuine, but, and they're even copying the same template. I can, I have talked to so many e-commerce agencies that I can look at someone's website and based off the way they speak, and based off a template of their website, I know whose course they went through. And that's how bad <laughs> exactly. it is. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Because obviously, with because we have the coaching program on the side, we know this is the same things as well. So when someone will come in from that has done another course and was not completely satisfied or just wants to dive a bit deeper into the Facebook ad side of things, they'll join our programs. And then, yeah, you'll see right away from the way the website or landing page looks like, the emails that they use in file reach, you can sort of tell right away which programs they've been through and what you know what mentors of coaching they've had you know prior to, to joining us but yeah it, it's crazy to see because even now like i don't have an e-com store i've got a shopify store where i just launched a couple of hoodies just for the fun of it so it's, it's i'm not an e-com store owner in any way shape or form but because i've got that shopify store connected to my email i still get like five to ten emails a day from agencies that are trying to pitch me and it's just the same cookie cooker uh cookie cuts their uh, templates over and over again it's it's just crazy to see like how the industry is sort of developing and how people are sort of 
becoming so lazy that they don't even want to put in the way for the outreach anymore. Yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. And another thing too, it's you know, I'm not gonna say my fear is I, I think it's sad that um people are inspired to get entrepreneurship and then without knowing it, they do the most competitive thing. Mm-hmm. Right? It's like yeah. there's so many ways to make life easier. Um, and I, I think a lot of people haven't really learned how to think critically about business. Um, for example, like supply and demand curve, like a boring concept, but like it's very relevant um for choosing what market to go into. Uh, for yeah. example, you can make an e-commerce agency work. We have some clients that crush it. Like, we, you know, uh, just to give an example, let's say that you're offering Facebook ads the same as everybody else. It might take you 500 prospects to get a meeting. We have some clients that have offers that are so good and not just offers, services, not, not Facebook ads as a service, like a unique offer, a unique service and a niche. You have those three things together and they're getting like one out of 40 people booking yeah. on the call. Like you look at the difference, that's 10 xing your results, not by working harder, just by doing something slightly different. So um, like the, the, the piece of advice I commonly give to people who have an e-commerce agency is like, hey, e-commerce is great. It's an upcoming market. It's awesome. It's fun to work with. It's very visual. However, you just got to either, you just got to do something different. And the, and the things that you can do different are one, your service. It's not just Facebook ads. There's there's Reddit ads, Twitter ads, Pinterest ads. You can do UGC. You can help people set up affiliate programs. You can help people cold email to sell a retail distribution. You can help them lower their product costs with customer support, with, you know, customer loyalty, CRO, VSLs. Yeah. Like that, that's a big list right there of things that are uh, potential. So you can do a different service. Uh, one is having a niche. Like everybody talks about a niche, but most people say, yeah, I have a niche. I normally work with jewelry brands. But if you look at their website, it doesn't say that. It says, Not hi, that. I do Facebook ads, like being fully branded around one thing. So that's the second. And the third is like, you know, are you targeting who everybody else is targeting? For example, you know, every targets US, UK, Australia, uh, Canada, and that's okay. Uh, but you're all targeting the same, you know, fitness, beauty, fashion companies where what if you targeted European companies and you targeted, um, I don't know, like someone selling tools or crafts or gardening supplies just something a bit different than everybody else and you know imagine if you implemented all of those things well then your life gets really easy yeah exactly man yeah it's, it's crazy how many people they'll start an agency and they'll do exactly what you just said facebook ads e-com and then yeah either fashion or jewelry sometimes they don't even get to that point like they'll, i'll ask them what their niche is and they'll say e-com as if e-com is like a small you know yeah. a small i was like no you need to go much more specific than that and like you said craft an irresistible offer. So not just Facebook ads, but maybe Facebook ads and email, Facebook ads and CRO, or like you said, you know, uh, rather than Facebook ads, UGC or TikTok. And you know, the possibilities are endless, but yeah, if you stick to that, just the generic, oh yeah, I'm a Facebook ads agency for, for e-com stores in the US, sure. then yeah, you're gonna have a tough time getting started because yes, the barrier to entry for social media marketing is low because there's no upfront investment, but it is getting crowded right now. There's a lot of people that are joining those courses, like you said, and then starting it and then not thinking further than, than just like, yeah, just the e-com Facebook ads uh, kind of stuff. So yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to see the market develop in that way. But then to focus on the outreach, if, if you do have an offer, if you do have a niche, you know, uh, you've got everything set up correctly, how would you recommend people get started with, with email outreach? Yeah, so one thing that I would say on outreach uh, to get started is a lot of people instantly get obsessed with the idea of automation, hands-off, yeah. passive, these keywords. When you're first starting out, it's likely that your time isn't worth much. And that's okay. Um, but with that being in mind, there's nothing wrong with doing things that don't scale when you first start out. That's how yeah. I got my first few clients. Um, you know, outside of just like cold email, like I knocked on doors. I sent like packages in the mail of handwritten letters. Um, I networked a lot. So people who are just starting out, let's say you're just starting out, maybe you have a part-time job. Right now your time's not really worth way too much and you have a good amount of it. I would send handwritten letters in the mail with a gift to dream prospects. You think about if you sent 10 of those out, you're going to get a meeting or two. Like it's, it, by the way, mail, like mail is so underrated. It's so yeah. good. So yeah. Good. Um, Fully personalized emails. 
So not using any template. Uh, one thing of e-commerce emails is that e-commerce store owners get so many emails, but they know all the telltale signs of a cold email. Uh, to give an example, if I'm cold emailing accountants, I'm going to use the subject line quick question because they haven't seen it. It works. If yeah. you send quick question to an e-com store owner, they instantly say, this is crap. You know, it, so yeah, when you're actually emailing e-commerce store owners, you're not actually, it's a bit of a weird concept, but you're not trying to write the best email. You're trying to write the email that doesn't look like the other emails. And sometimes that's tricky because like the best way to write it, write it, the best way to write it has already been done and you can't do that. So now yeah. it's like, how can you even just say things in a different way, a different order? Um, so it, yeah, very personalized outreach, packages in the mail, um, even door knocking. Like you can go on a tool like Store Leads, plug in your city uh, and it'll give you a list of stores in your city. And then what about going to the door with like brownies and a gift and like saying, Hi, nice to meet you. I'd love to see if I can help. I mean, I don't know anybody who does that and I'm sure it'll work because I did it when I was 15. I, I knocked on doors with candy and like flyers for my business and I, I got clients. Yeah, I think that's it, right? I think it's it's doing what other people are not doing and whether that's going the extra mile or just being extremely creative, you know, you you because the first thing you need to do is get someone to open your email. I once that's that's probably half the battle is not sort of being marked as read immediately, but actually having someone open their email. We've um we've actually got a guy in our program. He's a very crazy with like following up, and what he would do is he would send a photo of his foot, so a bare foot, by his bedroom door with the subject line, just trying to get my foot in the door again. And his, his reply rates and open rates crazy because it's it's unorthodox. Like people don't do that. It's 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 weird in a way as well. So because he was that creative, even though, you know, it probably wasn't like the best email, or the best subject line, because he was creative, you know, his reply rate shot up. Yeah, that's, that's, I like that example. Um, you know, one, one, one easy thing you can do is uh, personalized images. So there's tools like HyperEyes or on Lemlist. I, I use instantly to send, but you can use on Lemlist. You can put like as a merge field text. So like, let's say I hold a little whiteboard in my hands. I can say, Hey, Joshua, let's meet for coffee. But what I would do is I take that whiteboard and I travel with it. So I brought this whiteboard with me to many countries and I go in front of famous landmarks and I jump and do like the high school musical flattering feminine kick in the air and hold the whiteboard. I look yeah, ridiculous. Yeah. I'm six foot six. I mean, I look like an <laughs> idiot. And then I, and then I use that in my cold emails and people think it's funny. They answer. Yeah. So what, so the whiteboard, when you take that photo, is it empty? Or do you write? Yeah, it's empty. Oh, okay. and it's like a, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's smart, man. I like that. So what, yeah. what did you use? So that's not Lemlist, but it's, what did you say it was? I use a tool called Instantly for sending. However, Instantly doesn't have a way to add custom text like that. Uh, so you have to use an extension called Hyperize. But most people are probably sending on Lemlist and it has a ability to like do custom uh, text on images. Uh, yeah. But for, for people looking at a software to use, I recommend instantly reason. Be, so Lemless is probably still a bit of a better software, but the issue is Lemless charges you per inbox, which punishes yeah. you for doing the volume you need to get results that gets so expensive. Or like I recommend to beginners like 10 emails to start. That's going to be 600 a month on Lemless. It's going to be 99 a month on instantly. So yeah. Um, yeah, it instantly is generally a better option for people just starting out. Yeah. Yeah. Lemless gets expensive really quick to be fair because even now i've got two accounts on lemless which is like 120 month or something like that it's uh yeah. it's crazy like you said if, you, if you're just going to use the one email account then you're going to get marked as spam you're going to just burn out that whole domain yeah if, if i was on lemless right now i'm actually doing the numbers right here if i was on lemless right now i'd be paying twenty one thousand dollars a month Oof. yeah so, instantly yeah. Probably better off than there man yeah Instantly, I think it's like maybe 400 a month or something, I think for me, I'm, I'm not even sure, but it's it's nothing to the point of even like considering, you know, I mean, my whole business email outreach, like the fact that I can spend like 400 bucks a month for my software cost of sending emails across all my clients is ridiculous. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Just, so just instantly do all like the follow-ups and stuff as well, like Lemless. Yeah, it, it, it's basically Lemless with a few more bugs because it's new, um, but it, it's getting better and a bit less bells and whistles. Uh, but yeah. a lot, but again, you look at the impact of bells and whistles versus the ability to send 10 times more volume and the volume is going to win. 
Yeah, hundred percent, man. Yeah, the only reason. So I I use Lemless myself, and the only reason why I actually made that switch because I used Streak before that, which is basically like a Gmail plugin that allows you to send out email blasts. But there was no kind of follow up. Maybe there is now, but back then there was no follow up feature. So for me, like Lemless was the game changer because you could actually follow up within the same thread uh, multiple times sure. with automate. And for me, the fourth follow-up usually gets the most calls booked. So I, I knew I needed to follow up at least four times to get a call. So, you know, that made the decision quite easy to go to Lemless. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's definitely a good tool. It's just, uh, it's just the pricing. Because if e-com, all stuck in volume, uh, you cannot, like, say, I'm going to reach out to 500 people a month in the e-commerce space. You know, it's, it, it just funny. doesn't. Yeah. I, I recommend if you're starting out, I like... 3,000 to 5,000 per month. Yeah. Yeah. Cause my, um, so just FYI, mine's automated. So I, I don't basically have, I've not taken any advice that you've given me. Um, and I, I've got a 0.1% conversion rate. So from outreach to call book, which is extremely low. Um, and that is obviously because it, it's, it's automated, you know, as much as, as possible. Sure. Um, and because, yeah, because I know, cause I know those numbers, I just know I need to put in a lot of emails so that that equals at least one call, if not more. Yeah. And that, that's also factoring that I'm sure you have great case studies. I'm sure your landing pages are fine. And also you're Googleable, like you're, you're known yeah. in the space. Uh, that's a huge thing. Actually, we have some clients that have personal brands and they do significantly better than people who don't. Yeah. That's interesting because you, so when starting out, like one, one of the advices that I give and I've also received is don't focus too much on all the bells and whistles in terms of building a website, creating a logo, getting business cards created, et cetera. You know, actually focus on income producing activities, which is obviously outreach. But then it gets to a point where, you know, it, the tables actually turn and then you actually do need to focus on all that stuff to stand out from all the rest. Because I noticed the same thing. Once we actually started tailoring our website towards the niche that we're in and putting up testimonials, putting up results, et cetera, you know, it was much easier to get calls booked and to also convince clients that, you know, we're the right guys for the job. Yeah. It's funny. Cause that's one of the most commonly talked about things in business, like don't obsess on your website. And I think yeah. what people get wrong is you, you want to focus on income producing activities. However, making your website, relevant to a niche is an income producing activity combined with yeah. outreach Good what's point. not an income producing activity is posting inspirational quotes on instagram or or like posting blogs on your website or getting really obsessed with like building perfect design like that doesn't matter but like yeah you know having a linkedin that's presentable um like that matters having a website that clearly states what you do like that that does matter uh, another thing to throw in here i sound like a I sound like a mom but like <laughs> stop posting pictures of yourself drinking on social media like i i i, I yeah I know that's, that. that's a good one actually yeah i i have chosen not to hire people again like i'm not opposed to a drink or a joint i don't really care but i'm not gonna hire you if you have it on social media because i don't i have some very conservative clients and like, if they yeah. look up your name, it doesn't represent my brand value. So that's a really basic thing not talked about, but like people will Google you before they want to give up 30 minutes of time. They're going to look up your name. And when you look up your name, if you look like an idiot, uh, even if you don't think you look like an idiot, they might. So uh, it's definitely one thing to consider. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually, because like you said, usually people that want to start an agency are fairly young. So they'll just be either fresh out of uni or they'll still be in that uni party festival phase. And obviously, yeah, that comes paid with a lot of a lot of content, a lot of images. And yeah, clients look at that. And especially if you've got conservative clients, that's that's a, a big red flag for them. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like such a dad saying that because you know, you <laughs> grew up in high school, like be careful what you put on the internet, your teachers tell you. And yeah, it, it is true. Um, yeah, it, it may not hurt you. You won't, you won't know. That's the thing. Um, like when I we've we've landed some really big clients, like really big clients, and I know for a fact that they skimmed my socials. Like um, I remember you can see on LinkedIn like who's viewed your profile. Like I, I know they've looked. Like you know, it, yeah, they, they checked me out. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, you always do your due diligence before hopping on a call. I do the same. Like when I speak to a business owner or 
you know, someone that I've not necessarily met before, you'd always just do a little swipe on the internet to see, okay, even if it's just to, to figure out topics that you can discuss on the call to break the ice, you always just do a little check. So yeah, it's guaranteed that happens the other way around as well. So just make sure all your socials are uh, are clean and represent what you want that to represent. Yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, you um, so you mentioned at the start, definitely personalize as much as you possibly can because you know you've got the time, so might as well leverage it. But then you also mentioned the quantity aspect where you know you need to actually send out uh, you know a lot of emails um, to get that call booked. Which which part do you think weighs more when starting out? Is it the quality or the quantity? Sure. So what I see a lot of people do is they choose the middle, which is the worst place to be in my opinion, because the middle yeah. says, I'm going to do a little bit of personalization, but that way everything's personalized. What you want to do when you're first starting out is do the things that are almost impossible to automate. Package in the mail, handwritten photo, I mean, handwritten note, followed yeah. by a cold call, followed by an email, like the really massive unscalable things. That's what yeah. you first want to put time into. And then add on automated, but fully automated. I don't use any personal lines, any of my cold emails. Um, like that, that's where you want to put your time after. And then slowly take away yeah. from that really personal stuff as you move into the automated area. What you don't want to mm -hmm. be is like in the middle, because in the middle is very boring. You want to be super, super personalized and then transition your way into full automation. Yeah, I like that. I like what you mentioned there as well with the multiple platforms and the multiple basically multiple ways of reaching out to the same person. Because I think that's what a lot of people forget is like, okay, if they don't respond to your email, have you tried Instagram? Have you tried LinkedIn? Have you, if they've got a Twitter following, have you even tried Twitter? You know, there's a lot of ways of reaching out to the same person. Um, and that's actually one of the ways that when I used to work with Bradley Riley, I think you're familiar with him as well. Yeah. One of the ways we used to get a lot of clients through Upwork is by, we called it the three-pronged approach. So we'll send our proposal on Upwork but then we would also sort of try and figure out what the web, what the client was, what the website was, etc. Uh, just by looking at comments of previous um, like freelancers they had, etc. Sometimes they would give it away, say, "Oh yeah, it was really cool working with John," and hopefully the website www dot is now you know much better than it was before, or something like that. Try and figure out what the website was, and then send them a message on Facebook, send them a message on Instagram, just to follow up as much as possible, so that there's multiple ways of of them getting in touch with us. Yeah, that that's that's smart. I um I actually still do Upwork and I do something similar. Uh, Upwork actually, I don't know about the e-commerce space, but for cold email projects, we've gotten some pretty good clients off Upwork. Um, that's interesting. It's but most of them suck. So it's like the expectation is we we apply to every cold email job on Upwork in the U.S. every day, like every one of them, and yeah. then out of all of those, we only get on like one meeting a week because we really cut it down once we've had a conversation started. So it's maybe yeah. somewhere around 200 to 300 applications to one client. Um, but that's, you know, it's because there's a lot of small ones in Upwork. But we've gotten some, we have two clients right now that pay us $3,000 a month each that came off Upwork. Like you yeah. get some decent clients on there. Yeah, I think it's just consistency will work, right? Yeah, because most are unqualified. So what happens is most people, they do 100 pieces of outreach, they get on five meetings, one qualified people, and then they drop. When in reality, it's yeah. like, get to look at Upwork, like I'm going to get one good client every month or two months. Yeah, interesting, man. So in terms of- Retention, yeah. In, in terms of like following up then, what would you, obviously yeah, multiple platforms, but is there a certain number or amount of times that you'd recommend people to follow up? Or is it just like follow up as much as you possibly can until they either say, leave me alone or accept sure. uh, what it is that you're offering? So for ultra personalized follow up virtually forever, I would say now with automation, again, this is a bit more an advanced side, but there becomes an argument where you look at it, not in terms of just prospects, but in terms of how many emails can you process for your domains and email accounts. And then yeah. the argument becomes, is it more effective to reach out to more people per email or yeah. longer per person per email? Right right now we're actually doing it more people and fewer follow-ups but again yeah. that's that's at the scale of hundreds of emails we're looking at is this going to do five percent better is that going to do five percent better because it really matters at that scale uh, for most people reaching out to a prospect four to six times 
um, with a cold email. And then if they say they're interested, that's when you truly never stop following up with them. We will follow up with yeah. you for two years if you said you're interested. Now, if, if I've not heard anything from a, from somebody after four to six emails of a sequence, you know, what we do is we reach out to them a year later, unless they unsubscribe. If they unsubscribe, just leave them be. Uh, yeah. But if they, you know, didn't open or didn't reply, we just throw them in a sequence a year later. They'll have no idea who you are because they get 10 emails a day. So exactly. it's not like they're going to remember yeah. you. Yeah, 100%. There's actually um, um, a, a close friend of mine actually does the same. When a client leaves, they'll add them to a sequence to follow up like once every two months to say, hey, how are you guys getting on? You know, uh, are you guys still running ads, et cetera? You know, is there any, any questions that you've got about the current setup, you know, that I can maybe take a look at? And quite often that person will actually get clients that have left thinking they could get a better alternative, realize that whoever they've hired wasn't actually as good as, as them and then come back just by following up in like a post post client sequence almost. Yeah, that's smart. I like that. Yeah. But anyway, um, when so with with the outreach, what? Because obviously, there's a lot of people out there that will. I think now the transition's gone from trying to get people to become a client right away to having like a, a video in between, like Loom, for example. Um, what would you recommend having as the call to action when you first reach out to a business? Yeah, yeah, good question. One, one thing, this is on topic, but a little bit off on a different path. This comes down to, I've audited so many cold emails. Yeah. Please, for the love of God, don't ask the e-commerce business owner, do you want a loom? They don't know what the hell that is. I see this <laughs> so common. Like, uh, do you want a loom? What, what is that? I don't know what that is. So uh, getting into a little bit of copywriting, you always want to write to people, assuming they don't know the same key terms as you. What is yeah. ROAS, it's return on ad spend. What is a loom? It's a video audit showing X, Y, and Z. So uh, a bit varied off the path there. Um, looms, yes, looms do work. Um, again, it becomes the argument when you have clients and you're busy of scale versus the time that goes into those looms, right? So that that's something but that eventually you'll run into. Now, when I say that, I'm not talking to people who have under five clients. Because those are the ones who hear about that are like, okay, no looms, just volume. Like, no, okay, you need to do the looms. Uh, yeah. But, you know, eventually I think that sending more volume becomes a better alternative than sending looms. Uh, but normally for the call to action, uh, we're, we're asking somebody to get on the phone. But we have a lot of creative ways to do it. Like we have a swipe file of about 100 different call to actions. And oh, wow. um, we, we split test them. Uh, and, you know, some work for certain industries. Like if you have a guarantee, for example, I'll give a freebie away. Uh, would you be yeah. interested in a 15 minute call hearing more about how our guarantee works? Like that's, that's a call to action that works well for guarantees. Um, yeah. That's powerful. Yeah. Um, for not e-commerce, you can do like whatever you want to talk. Um, but, uh, for e-commerce, you gotta be a bit more crafty. Yeah. Yeah. I think cause it's so crowded in the e-commerce space, everyone's, they've already seen the, you know, the, the loom approach. They've, they've basically seen every every approach and every call to action, you know, known to man. So you definitely need to be a bit more creative. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, one thing I always tell some of my friends who have done well in e-commerce is if you're doing well in e-commerce right now, you know, I don't know what, you know, maybe you sell your agency, maybe you switch it. You're going to make, I don't actually make more money. You're going to get so many more meetings if you switch to something else. Um, yeah at some point because you've if you're if you're doing good at e-com with outreach like really good you're gonna do great somewhere else yeah 100 percent. or even if you just niche down within e-com so not just go for broad e-com not go for fashion or jewelry because everyone's doing that uh, like you said if you just go for something that is quite unusual then you're already going to do 10 times better yeah yeah. Um, one example is we have a campaign going after alcohol companies right now, like alcohol e-commerce brands. Yeah. They're doing pretty good. I don't know. Again, that's else something that you don't hear about. Brands. Yeah. yeah. That's crazy, man. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, this has been incredibly valuable, even for me, like just hearing all the stuff that I need to start changing up with my outreach. Have you got like one last piece of advice or one thing that if people start doing email outreach that they need to know? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think the, the biggest, we've kind of already gone over it, but yeah, one, the, 
how do I put it? Uh, I, I was talking to somebody about, well, what should my offer be? What should my website be? You know, if I want to be different and I gave him some ideas and Vinve told me, great, where do I go learn that? And that's the, that's the thing to, to do things that are going to work really well. You need to be able to figure out how to learn on your own. And I really yeah. believe that learning is a skill and to do the things that are going to be the least competitive outreach. You can't expect there to be a course that walks you through step-by-step. Step. That's why yeah. it does better. So I think developing that mindset of I'm going to figure out how this works. I don't need to be spoon fed. Um, it's going to help you if you're outreach and also every other area of business. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, man. Stop stop doing what everyone else is doing and try and figure it out by yourself. Yeah, yeah man. Exactly. That's cool. Anyway, if, if people are interested in your outreach service or just want to connect with you in general, what's the best place for them to do that? Yeah, sure. So to connect in general, uh, my YouTube is Michael Gardner. If you look up like Michael Gardner cold email, I'm sure I'll show up in a search. Um, and if you're interested in having me help out for outreach, more than likely, you know, if you in the works one who works with me, you'll probably be doing, um, you know, you have an offer, you have a service, you have that nailed in, you want to really scale. Uh, my website is dfymeetings.com. You can book a call with my team there. Yeah, awesome, man. Yeah, so for those of that watch to the end of the chat or the video and want to connect with Michael or check out his channel, I'll uh, I'll leave everything in the description box down below. But um, yeah, for now we will wrap up this video here. Thank you so much for watching. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you guys in the next video.